Hi, welcome uh, to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's webinar on climate change, extreme heat, and public health. My name is Claudia Brown, and I'm a health scientist with the CDC's Climate and Health Program, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So today we have experts from academia, the federal government, community-based organizations, and media that are coming together to discuss the interconnected issues between climate change, extreme heat, and community health efforts to reduce heat-related deaths and illness. This is the third webinar of the Climate and Health Science webinar series, which highlights the pressing need for greater scientific and civic engagement to protect public health from a changing climate. Next slide. So today's webinar will feature presentations from Dr. Rish Nathan from the CDC Climate Health Program, Matthew Roach from the Arizona Department of Health Services, Dr. Jalan White Newsom from Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, Dr. Sharon Harlan from Northeastern University, and Dr. Andrew Pershing from Climate Central. During the webinar, we ask that you engage with us and submit questions in the Q&A. We'll have some time after each presentation for a few questions and then a more in-depth discussion during the last 20 minutes of today's webinar. Next slide. So to kick us off, we have a presentation from Dr. Rish Vaidya Nathan. Rish is a senior health scientist with the Climate Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Center of Environmental Health. His training and work experience cover a wide range of substantive areas, including environmental engineering, exposure assessment, epidemiology, and data science. Over to you, Rish. Thank you, Claudia. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today I'll be presenting on CDC's uh, heat and health activities, and I'll be describing some of our translational research and epidemiological projects and how we translate health evidence to inform early warning systems, near real time public health surveillance, and vulnerability assessments. Next slide, please. So we're experiencing one of the hottest summers in recent years. And if you look at the monthly temperature outlook that NOAA produces for the month of August, uh, you can see areas in the Western US, upper Midwest and the Northeast will likely be experiencing warmer than normal or exceptionally hot temperatures. And consequently, you know, our news cycle has been dominated by articles on extreme heat. And some of these articles highlight how heat exposure is affecting disadvantaged populations, outdoor workers, including farm workers, and the impact of heat on power grids and critical infrastructure. We've even heard how heat and high humidity is impacting athletes taking part in the Tokyo Olympics. And quite rightly, several news articles from reliable media sources are making the connection between climate change and these extreme weather events. Next slide, please. CDC's Climate and Health Program um, has been conducting translational research products, projects on various heat-related topics for over 10 years. Our heat-related work falls under various categories as uh, identified on this slide. And one of the primary drivers for us when conducting surveillance and epidemiological projects is to build an evidence base for informing various downstream climate adaptation efforts. And I will be highlighting results from some of our heat-related projects. Next slide, please. Uh, we recently published two MMWR reports on heat. One on heat-related emergency department visits observed during the recent Pacific Northwest heat wave. We partnered with National Syndromic Surveillance Program for this analysis. Heat-related illness uh, were identified using a combination of free text and that describes patient's reason for visit, also known as chief complaint information, and also combine that with administrative discharge diagnoses to, with, that indicate exposure to high ambient temperatures. And the graph that you see in the bottom shows how uh, you know, the ED visits by day changed during the course of May and June in the Pacific Northwest region. And we compared that to the 2019 summer for that same region, as well as compared to other regions in the US to get a sense of how uh, 
destructive the heat wave was in terms of uh, having people go to the ER up note. We saw an increase that was quite remarkable as more than 1,000 ED visits were observed on one single day. And close to 3,500 ED visits diagnosed as heat related uh, were observed during the entire heat wave period. What's also important to understand here is that there are heat related ED visits uh, and there are also other outcomes that are influenced by heat, but that are not captured when we are using discharge diagnosis. And the MMWR article on the right, published last year on heat related deaths, you know, sheds light on some of the comorbid conditions that are associated with heat. In addition, in that article, we were able to summarize differences in mortality rates by individual risk factors associated with heat, such as age, race, sex, and ethnicity. Next slide, please. So here's a graphic from another article we recently published on extreme heat exposure and hospital admissions. As I mentioned, heat exposure is associated with various chronic health conditions, including cardiorespiratory, renal failure, and diabetes-related disorders. This graphic summarizes a few different aspects of our analyses. First, as you can see, heat exposure is significantly associated with all cause and various cause-specific hospitalizations. And the heat risk and the resulting health burden varies as a function of heat index. You know, that's the horizontal bar that you see on the chart. Uh, the heat index at which you see peak hospital admissions, that is the red checkered boxes that you see in the graphic, varies with climate region. And when you compare that information with existing heat alert criteria, the, that is the vertical gray bar, you can see for some regions, there is a discrepancy between temperature ranges at which you see health alerts being issued and, and, and temperature ranges that are, correspond to significant health burden. Also, given that health burden occurs over a range of heat index values, you know, there is an opportunity for the health community to work with weather agencies for refining existing heat forecast products. And uh, so after evaluating this systematically for various climate regions in the US, we work with National Weather Service to identify thresholds that are appropriate from a public health perspective. And the graphic on the right shows you how we translated some of the thresholds based on this analysis into a color-coded heat risk product available from National Weather Service. Next slide, please. Oh. We've also examined how social vulnerability and other community level characteristics modify heat health relationships. Uh, heat risk among disadvantaged populations and vulnerability due to socioeconomic risk factors are important considerations for emergency response and public health in general. So we came up with a framework for evaluating various social vulnerability metrics that are sensitive to predict predicting heat related adverse health outcomes. We first started with a suite of community level variables and using a statistical framework, we shortlisted predictors that are significantly associated with heat related health burden. Factors like higher proportion of minority populations as defined based on race and ethnicity, higher proportion of people with limited English speaking ability, lower socioeconomic status using variables like percent unemployment and poverty, as well as uh, in a high proportion of multifamily residential units now, uh, these were really significant predictors and corresponded with heat health uh, relationships or sensitive to heat, modifying the heat health relationships. And what we did with that was we created a rating based on those variables to get at some county level heat related social vulnerability rating that is very specific to heat and how we could probably use that in subsequent epi analysis. So the graphic on the right shows how the heat related social vulnerability rating modifies that baseline relationship between cardiovascular mortality and heat exposure. So the upper right, the red curve shows you the baseline heat related risk associated with cardiovascular mortality. And as you can see, there is a nonlinearity in that heat related risk. And when you look at the effect modification by heat related social vulnerability rating, you can see how uh, that difference between areas with high and low vulnerability is larger at higher temperatures. 
And you can see the difference based on the curves, how the, the difference in that curve is accentuated at higher temperatures. This also tells us how social vulnerability and other related factors are important during heat waves. Next slide, please. Another facet of our work is to address data gaps and provide meaningful heat health products online. So we've been working with National Environmental Public Health Tracking Program and developed this dashboard. So we call this the Heat Health Tracker and is built on the IT platform developed by CDC's tracking program with scientific input and guidance from the Climate and Health Program. The latest iteration of this dashboard offers information on temperature forecasts, monthly outlooks uh, for temperature, and more importantly, we're also providing near real-time health information from the National Syndromic Surveillance Program. Next slide, please. And uh, so far, I've been uh, you know, talking about the work conducted by the CDC's Climate and Health Program, but organizations that we work with as part of Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative and other grant recipient mechanisms have been working on heat-related topics for a long time and have accomplished a lot. So their work has been instrumental in shoring up climate adaptation efforts in various parts of the United States and preparing populations to adapt to extreme temperature regimes under a changing climate. Next slide, please. Yep, and this is my last slide, thank you. Thanks, Rish. Uh, so don't go anywhere. We have a few questions coming in. So first I'll address, I see quite a few comments about not seeing slides, though um, others can, and we can see them on our side. I'll say maybe try restarting Zoom or a view button and change the view that you're seeing. Uh, also, we will we are recording this and we'll be posting it online. Uh, so to some questions for you, Rish. Um, one question is, is CDC uh, mapping heat vulnerability, coordinating with data information such as Cal Enviro screen in California? Yeah, so we are using, uh, you know, several different exposure metrics and several different like, you know, vulnerability information. And a lot of that information is available on the heat hill tracker. And also, you know, we can point you to other resources that are outside of the climate and health program that have you successfully used, you know, information from census and other data sources, as you mentioned. Great, and one more question from uh, Jessica Kastner. As an emergency nurse scientist, this research is so valuable and important to clinical translation, so thank you. Can you please comment on using the daily maximum for heat index as opposed to daily minimum or delta between daily min and max uh, or sensitivity analyses of variations of heat measures? Yeah, that's a great question. So. We use daily max uh, primarily or heat index uh, as our exposure variable primarily because like uh, prior research suggested that heat index uh, was very uh, was the variable that um, that is most sensitive to heat related health outcomes. But uh, it's important to consider other temperature measures as well, especially the minimum temperature is very important in places where you do not have air conditioning prevalence. And, and the nighttime cooling, as reflected by uh, the variable, the daily min variable, is very important to consider. So uh, we definitely will take that into consideration in our subsequent analyses. Thank you. Great, so lots of other uh, questions coming in, but we'll have to hold until the discussion. Uh, I will add on the IT side, if you are using the Zoom browser, I've heard that um, that tends to have more technical difficulties versus the Zoom application. So uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, so next uh, we have uh, Matt Roach. So Matt is joining us. Uh, from the, as he's an epidemiology program manager with the Arizona Department of Health Services. He has an MPH in epidemiology from the University of South Florida and currently oversees the climate and health program, environmental public health tracking and environmental health capacity programs. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Matt, over to you. Great, good afternoon everyone and thank you for the introduction, Claudia. I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this CDC webinar and share about our public health interventions for extreme heat in Arizona. Next slide. 
So Arizona is one of the hottest places to live during the months of May to September. There are 110 plus degree day days that are not in common. And these extreme temperatures, if not taken seriously, can lead to detrimental impacts on our health. We have thousands of ED visits and hundreds of deaths related to heat. And in 2020, we saw an increase in the number of extreme heat days and heat related deaths. Next slide. The summer of 2020 was one of our hottest summer seasons. And this calendar shows the number of days in each month with excessive heat warnings issued by the National Weather Service. In 2020, the heat warning started in late April. And as you can see in August, more than half the month was designated as an excessive heat day. Overall, we had 48 days of heat warnings when the average was around 18 per year. Next slide. In Phoenix, Arizona, the state capital, we had a record 53 days over 110 degrees last year. That's almost two months in the year at these dangerous temperatures. Next slide. So how do we address these chronic heat challenges? The Arizona Department of Health Services is part of the CDC's Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative and has used this grant funding to build out a climate and health program, which has a major focus on heat. Our heat safety page covers prevention, recognition, and treatment of heat-related illness, toolkits for vulnerable populations, heat surveillance reports, and links to sign up for heat alerts. Generally, local health officials will generally cite this information on here. Next slide. The department will also send out social media messages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram about upcoming heat warnings and heat safety messages throughout the entire summer. Additionally, we use the Gov Delivery Service to send out heat warnings to an email listserv of more than 20,000 people signed up, as well as test, text message alerts. These alerts include a current map of the National Weather Service Heat Risk Tool, which indicates by color higher health risk areas and the boundary of heat warnings, as well as the dates of the warning. We also include prevention tips. Next slide. The media, emergency preparedness, and local health officials will ask about the impact of our recent heat waves. And ADHS uses the National Syndromic Surveillance Program's Essence tool to build county-specific dashboards to share with local epidemiologists, which display heat emerging department visits by day, race, age, and sex to help monitor the impact. Here on the slide, we overlaid maximum and minimum temperatures with a percent of daily HRI or heat-related illness ED visits filling up the hospitals. Next slide. In collaboration with our National Weather Service Phoenix office and our state syndromic surveillance program, we had an opportunity to share syndrome data. The graph here combines the percent of ED heat visits with the National Weather Service heat risk categories, as well as the days of excessive heat warnings. You can see here that the data correlates well between the warning days and the increase in cases. Next slide. 2020's record-breaking heat was tracked using our hospital discharge data, which allowed us to track ED visits and hospitalizations. Vital records data helped us to enumerate the number of deaths. In 2020, we had 2,414 ED visits and 893 hospitalizations, and a record 522 deaths. The number of deaths generally has never been more than 300, and as a high-level overview, we use ICD-10 diagnosis codes to pull these records. Next slide. You may hear on the news about cooling centers opening during a heat wave. A cooling center or cooling shelter is a public location, typically with air conditioning that has been designated to provide free respite from the heat. Examples include libraries, community centers, shopping malls, but not all public health officials are familiar with what cooling centers in their jurisdiction look like or how they operate. Over the last seven years, we have worked with several county health departments and university researchers to help us investigate how well these centers are working to help vulnerable populations and find and implement improvement strategies. Next slide. So in collaboration with Yuma County's Public Health Department, which is located on the border with Mexico and California, their emergency management was interested in improving cooling centers due to their chronic heat issues as seen in the news articles. Next slide. So in partnership with the county and Arizona State University, we conducted three evaluation surveys with people who identify as homeless, cooling center facility managers, and older adults. 
Using these evaluation tools used in prior cooling center evaluations, such as some done in Maricopa County or Phoenix are located, and input from local health officials, we did a boots on the ground field work, talking with people and providing them resources to help them out, such as cooling towels and water bottles for people who are homeless. We asked about their knowledge of cooling centers, the perception of heat risk, and also conducted the evaluations in English and in Spanish. Next slide. Here you can see an infographic of results that were shared with the cooling centers in Yuma. We found that a majority of the cooling centers users walked and did not have a regular home, and word of mouth was a strong way to find out about them. Additionally, we found out that people who are Spanish speaking were less likely to know where the cooling centers are located. So this provides an opportunity for improvement in the outreach. Next slide. Yuma County Public Health sent to partners and put on their website a cooling center recruitment form. Our program helped them with mapping the locations and developed a flyer on, which, on the right, which is posted online and shared with partners. And Yuma went from one cooling center in the county to nine after our efforts. Next slide. 2020 and COVID-19 had detrimental effects on our heat work and notably the number of available cooling centers dropped in the Phoenix area from 106 to nine. In partnership with Arizona State University, we published the lessons learned document on our heat website and shared them with statewide heat work group partners. This includes safety measures to take to operate a cooling center using CDC guidance and examples of protocols developed and unique strategies, such as opening a convention center as a cooling shelter. This document also represents the new normal of integrating simultaneous hazards into planning. Next slide. School-aged children are a vulnerable population to extreme heat with their many outdoor activities for physical education and sports. So ADHS and our county health departments were receiving numerous requests from partners and school administrators for better guidance on how to protect kids from the heat. Many of the questions involve guidance on what temperatures can kids safely play outside and when should they be indoors. We used an occupational safety framework and epidemiological data to draft a first ever heat safety guidance document with thresholds and policy recommendations to help school staff with decision-making of outdoor activities during extreme heat. Next slide. Collaborating with the CDC Climate and Health Program, we were able to apply a similar epidemiological method that was discussed in the previous presentation with Arizona data for school-aged children emerging department visits for heat-related illness. We use them for identifying thresholds that are appropriate for school-age populations. We also try to be more granular and split up the data by climate regions of the state that were hotter or colder. The chart below shows the highest attributable risk by temperature increments, and the colors coordinate to different levels of in intervention. Next slide. The yellow category refers to actions to take in the preheat season or spring, such as installing artificial shading and water misters. The lowest positive attributable risk, or green, is a good time to educate school staff on HRI prevention, recognition, and treatment. The blue color is one category below the highest attributable risk and includes all the options school officials can take before making the decision to keep kids indoors, such as moving activities to the cooler part of the day. And finally, the red color, or our highest attributable risk, is based on the highest number of cases we see at this temperature. And at this point, we recommend keeping kids indoors um, to keep them safe. Next slide. So we had some positive feedback. We piloted this with schools and sent it out. And some of the verbal comments we had back were excellent validation tool for current processes and great tool for future planning. And I found the information quite helpful and included information regarding heat safety in my newsletter to parents on the last day of our regular preschool year. Next slide. Another method of stakeholder collaboration is that every year in partnership with National Weather Service and Arizona State University, we hold a statewide heat planning meeting at the beginning of the heat season. And generally we have more than 100, 100 to 200 people attend from multiple sectors, such as elected officials, the media, emergency preparedness, city planners, nonprofits, public health, uh, first responders, university researchers, and more. And these meetings are held early in the spring to help prepare for the upcoming heat season and also showcase the great efforts from partners. So this just shows on this slide the total charges for heat related illness that uh, we share with partners to show that it is a, um, a public health issue. We know that numbers really translate well to getting implemented in a higher part of a strategic plan. And in summary, 
Uh, just to wrap things up, Arizona's current chronic heat could be what other states face in the future. And there's a need to plan for simultaneous hazards and preparing and responding to challenges. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, next slide again. Uh, and, and preparing and responding to these challenges takes collaboration across multiple sectors. Uh, next slide. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, I'm loving the engagement going on in the chat and on the questions and answers. We have a lot of really great questions. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna keep going uh, so that we can have more time for discussion uh, and kind of panel panelist interaction. Um, so next slide. So next we have uh, Dr. Jalan White Newsom. She is the founder of Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, a strategic consulting firm with the mission of transforming communities through the development of people-centered solutions that tackle issues such as climate change, public health, environmental injustice, and advancing racial equity. Jalan has multi-sector experience, having worked in environmental philanthropy, state government, nonprofit, grassroots, academia, and private industry. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Jalan. Over to you. Not a problem. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. So Rish and Matt, thank you so much. I learned so much in those couple of minutes, all the tools that you shared in the work that you're doing. So good afternoon and thank you CDC for having this conversation. Um, boy, I wanna start out by giving honor to my ancestors that have allowed me to do the work that I do. And as well as the land that I'm on, which is the original lands of the Potawatomi here in Southeastern Michigan outside of Detroit. So when I started undergrad at Northwestern University, um, I landed in Chicago during the middle of one of the most devastating heat waves that resulted unfortunately in the deaths of hundreds of folks, primarily poor, black and brown, older Americans, and others that were isolated living in high-rise apartments. My front row seat to that 1995 heat wave left an impression on me. In 2003, during the summer of my wedding and honeymoon in Paris, I was once again too close to a heat wave that the one that struck Southern France and again killed many Parisians that year. And so yes, Chicago and Paris both opened my eyes to the impacts of extreme heat. But when extreme heat impacted my grandparents in Detroit years later, it really hit home. My grandparents along with their neighbors, other low income older adults, and those that didn't have access to air conditioning were suffering from extreme heat repeatedly during my time as a doctoral student at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, I partnered with the Detroit Health Department to help them shape their emerging program on extreme heat. So my dissertation was at the intersection of climate change, health and environmental justice. And it included monitoring indoor temperatures of older Americans, looking and tracking their adaptive and maladaptive behaviors conducting outreach and education at senior centers and working with local law folks and city councils and meteorologists to make sure that the word was getting out. I wanted my work to be a wake up call and not just a bunch of published papers because as I learned in Chicago and Paris that just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean that ambivalent ignorance is a sufficient excuse for not acting, particularly when we can actually tackle this threat that is invisible and so now over 20 years later, it's troubling that we are still having these same conversations. I will admit that there has been progress. You actually hear about it in the media. I think awareness has been raised, but we still have people that are getting sick and dying due to extreme heat across the US and beyond, which is unacceptable. We know what the vulnerabilities are. We've studied the causes, the trends, the impacts, but for some reason, this combination of layered vulnerabilities and our failed infrastructure continues to fail the folks that deserve to be protected the most. So for some low-income communities and communities of color, indigenous communities, houseless folks that I've worked with, it's not just the heat that's the problem. It's the cumulative impact of environmental stressors, social stressors, climate stressors, economic stressors that continue to test the endurance of communities across this country. It's the fact that when we talk about spatial inequity, whether it's more concrete, less trees, no cooling centers, 
That is the reality that many communities are living with. And it's very much in line with that thing that public health folks say all the time, your zip code determines your health. And I would add on to say, your zip code also determines your heat. So with that context, I wanna speak very briefly to two questions. The first is why do we continue to see the same communities disproportionately impacted by heat related climate threats? The second question, what do we do about it? <laughs> so let's start with the why. As a trained chemical engineer, infrastructure for me was always super important. I loved climbing big distillation columns, working with pumps, lines, whatever. It was always very important to keep our plant running. However, when it comes to dictating health outcomes in communities, there are three types of infrastructure that are critical to protecting folks from climate extremes. The first is the physical infrastructure, which includes the energy grid, pipes, roads, homes, parks, green space, the list can go on and on. The second is the service infrastructure. So our health centers, our doctors, our emergency responders, our grocery stores, our government services. And the last is our social infrastructure. So this is the community, the block clubs, the community centers, and other places that serve as community anchors. So in most communities of color and low-income communities, what I've witnessed is that the social infrastructure proves time and time again to be beyond resilient and unfortunately able to endure more than anyone should have to. The social infrastructure is not the weakest link. It's the physical and service infrastructure that continues to fail, which is why we continue to see increases in heat-related sickness and death, why we have hundreds of folks displaced due to flooding, and let us not forget the rates of COVID that's always been higher in certain communities. So in addition to that failed infrastructure, there are what I call the three E's that also drive this reality as well. Embodied inequity, expendability, and environmental racism. So let's start with embodied inequity. So the consequences of spatial inequity did not happen overnight. There have been multiple studies over decades that document the disproportionate burden of toxic waste and air pollution in communities of color across this country, coupled with communities that are not built to withstand climate extremes. I wanna posit that there has been embodied inequity in the way our cities have been planned, embodied inequity in where incinerators were placed, embodied inequity in the ways freeways cut through our historic African-American communities. It's embodied in equity and the lack of response and the lack of environmental enforcement. Spatial inequities exist because it was planned to be that way. And what drives planning? Money and questionable leadership. The second E is expendability. One term that is used in public health is called DALYS or D-A-L-Y-S, which stands for Disability Adjusted Life Years. It's basically a time-based measure that combines years of life loss due to premature death, a burden of disease or disability. When I first heard this as a doctoral student, I was like, oh my God, this is kind of morbid. But as I've continued in this work, I believe we need to convey this same message when we look at our spatial inequities by neighborhoods, census tract or city blocks. What is the dally for our communities? We know our lives are being cut short by our environment. And why do we continue to see these same spatial inequities? Well, it's because some communities are seen as expendable. And I see I have a minute left and a lot to go. So environmental racism is the last E. And again, what I will say very quickly is that environmental racism drives the disinvestment in the communities that we know have been spatially embodied with inequities. So if we know a zip code floods repeatedly, if we know we have a higher percentage of folks experiencing heat related illness, why do we not focus our efforts in most places? So I have just two slides for you and I'm gonna try and do them in 30 seconds. So <laughs> Renee, if you can show my one slide. So I wanna offer again, my top 10 list of how we can begin to better address heat extremes. Again, this is not rocket science, but I believe I wanna call your attention particularly to the third bullet, which is tackling systemic and institu institutional racism to the sixth bullet around, again, collecting what's working. And then number 10, community engaged resiliency planning. So maybe we'll have some more time afterwards to dig into these. The next slide, Renee. And I think what's most important, and I think what Matt said at the end is that we cannot, in, in any sectors that we sit in roles that we are, we cannot do this on our own. 
you know, we all have our sectors, we all have our silos, but how do we get to beyond that? And so I wanna offer this matrix again around climate change and extreme heat and how the different actors and sectors that are in that top row can begin to work together and actually fill each other's gaps. So a very quick example. So if you look at the public health practitioners column, the second column, and you look at preparation, it could be co-designing a community response plan with impacted communities as an example, or with industry in the column in terms of response, providing materials to create resilience hubs in communities. And again, you could look at the different specific examples because I am firmly a believer in that if you let folks know what the opportunities are, my hope is that people will begin to work together. And the last thing that I just wanna say is if you look at the bottom of this slide, intentionally it is people. And that is essentially what should drive and be the foundation of any work that we do across our different sectors. So again, I do hope that this inspires you to recognize and acknowledge the why, acknowledge the roles that each of us have and act accordingly. Because 10 years from now, we, I don't wanna be having the same conversation, but I would rather be talking about how many lives have been saved because of what we did in 2021 together. So thanks so much for your time. Sorry for running over and I'm looking forward to the discussion. No apologies, that was amazing. Thank you, Jalan. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on and hopefully talk more and more about this in the discussion. Uh, so next we have joining us, Dr. Sharon Harlan. Uh, Sharon is a chair and professor in the Department of Health Sciences at Northeastern University. Her research is focused on excessive heat and urban water systems as significant and increasingly critical threats that produce unequal risk to human health and well-being in neighborhoods divided by social class and race and ethnicity. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for joining us. Thank you, Claudia, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be hearing these uh, great presentations today and to be speaking. I think by this point in the webinar, you are going to start to hear uh, similarities and echoes of themes uh, that others have, have talked about. I was asked to talk with you today about how heat has disproportionate effects on marginalized populations and the way I incorporate equity perspectives in heat preparedness and response. I'll be talking a little outside the box of uh, traditional public health responses to heat preparedness. Much of my work is summarized in this chapter um, and I'm giving other references throughout the presentation. I do wanna stress how important the public health community has been in raising awareness about the dangers of extreme heat and to encourage further advocacy and cooperation with other, other governmental agencies, nonprofits, industry, and scientists. Next slide, please. Um, the, the problem we are trying to solve, uh, protecting people from heat injury and death is a moving target. As we've seen this summer, heat's grip on this country is becoming stronger and reaching places that are unheard of. Um, Research by the Union of Concerned Scientists projects a large increase in places and people that will experience more days of extreme heat by mid to late century. Next, next slide, please. There have been effective and valiant efforts by state and county health departments and the National Weather Service to communicate with the public about dangerous heat. Since 2005 in Phoenix and Maricopa County, Arizona, where I have done my research, there has been significant leadership on these issues as you, as you have heard from Matthew Roach. Yet overall, as he said, and as I'm showing here, the overall annual trend in heat deaths is upward since uh, county health began tracking heat mortality. Some of this might be due, this reporting, to uh, better monitoring but this last steep climb, according to other researchers, cannot be attributed to that or to temperature alone, even though it is very hot in Phoenix. In 2006, these researchers found that the increase in death, the annual increase was not related to temperature differences and it happened in spite of aggressive public health protective measures. So I believe this is evidence that public health measures and heat warning systems should be accompanied by other pathways, taking a, an expansive view of the problem. Next slide, please. 
In order to address the complexities of heat vulnerability, I prefer to think of coupled natural and human systems that are intersecting and interdependent. Specifically here, I'm interested in the three inner circles that associate urban microclimates and neighborhood socioeconomic characteristics. Through historical processes of uneven economic development in neighborhoods that were and are segregated by social class and race, we have produced urban heat riskscapes where temperatures are higher and poor people and people of color are more exposed and less equipped to adapt. The distributions of temperatures and other ecosystem services have implications for risk management and successful adaptation. In places with hazardous environments, we need to be especially diligent about addressing living conditions and other factors that undermine health. Next slide, please. To visualize the historical roots of this complex problem and to illustrate what I mean by uneven development, here are two pairs of photos taken a century apart in different areas of Phoenix. These show the historical legacy of settlement and redlining in the early 20th century and the resulting legacy of the unequal built environments that exist today. Next slide, please. Further emphasizing the social dimensions of climate equity, I suggest we focus on addressing the structural problems of poverty and racism in the broader society, in US cities, in the whole United States, and in other nations. The moral grounding for this approach comes from the theoretical work of noted political philosopher, John Rawls, who asserted the difference principle of distributive justice. Inequalities in society should be remedied to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. Next slide, please. The principles of climate justice adapted to the specific threat of extreme heat are a pro-poor pathway that recognizes structural limitations on adaptive capacities. This pathway is toward building assets of the poor and including them in decision-making so they can protect themselves and have meaningful involvement in how to address climate change. And following this pathway, we hope to achieve a fair distribution of benefits from, from uh, a fair distribution of benefits from extreme heat and promote uh, co-benefits for health and livelihoods. Next slide, please. For my last few slides, I'll use some more examples from Maricopa County to illustrate what I've said about urban heat riskscapes and suggestions about how to build assets of neighborhoods in a hot, arid environment. This is a neighborhood scale map of a cumulative vulnerability index in the urbanized county centered on Phoenix. We have ample research that shows here and in other cities that the poorest neighborhoods and the most people of color are the hottest. Higher maximum, minimum, average air and surface temperatures and more hours per day of exposure. Part of the reason for this is less vegetation, tree cover and shade and more impervious surfaces in the poorest places. The green circles in this map indicate where all the residential heat related deaths occurred over eight years in the early 2000s. And statistically, these deaths occur very disproportionately in the most vulnerable neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Operationalizing the difference principle in the prevention of heat illnesses and deaths, here are four priority local action areas that can be supported by state and federal policies and funding. These interventions reach into the social fabric of society. Targeted resources for outdoor heat mitigation by creating parks and shade trees where they're needed most. Sherman Park was eventually transformed thanks to the persistent neighborhood association that teamed with an Arizona State University student to convince the city of the climatological and health benefits of vegetation. Tree planting and maintenance and blue spaces are essential in low income neighborhoods. Most recently, we've researched the impacts of cool roofs in Phoenix or white reflective materials. And because the poorer neighborhoods are more densely populated and have more roof area, this is a particularly effective strategy. Next slide, please. Over time, the Maricopa County Public Health Department has reported a surprisingly high percentage of heat that caused deaths indoors. 
In most cases, this is because people can't afford to pay the electric bill to run the air conditioners or can't afford to repair units or the landlord has not kept equipment in working order. Through actions like those listed here on the right, we need to create affordable, clean energy for all homes. Next slide, please. The deaths of homeless people in a 2005 heat wave brought the full force of local government's attention to the problems of extreme heat in Arizona, uh, in Maricopa County. A series of reforms were enacted as Matt described um, and have been you know, very successful. Nevertheless, the reports continue to document a shortage of resources to meet the needs. And these problems will only grow worse with the rent debt incurred during the COVID-19 pandemic and the expiration of eviction moratoria. There are many, many actions needed to house people such as those listed here on the right. Next slide, please. The third climate justice principle calls for greater self-determination for low-income communities to create healthy living environments. This requires support and action from the scientific and professional communities to obtain all the amenities I just discussed. But it is often not effective to talk to neighborhood associations about climate change or hot weather. It is better to deal with their issues, knowing that better protection from extreme heat is a co-benefit of the healthier environments that they want to create in ways that they determine. And finally, my last slide. There are physical limits to human tolerance of high temperatures that the earth may well exceed in the longer run. But political choices about social inequalities will dictate most human health consequences of extreme heat in the foreseeable future. Using the difference principle, and a better understanding of the relationship between climate vulnerability and structural income and racial ethnic inequalities in the United States, we can design effective interventions to mitigate extreme heat hazards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, again, lots of great questions. We're uh, keeping tabs of them and we'll bring them back up uh, after this last presentation. So next slide. Uh, so next we have uh, Dr. Andrew Pershing, who is the Director of Climate Science at Climate Central, a climate science and climate change communications organization based in Princeton, New Jersey. His research takes a multidisciplinary approach to understanding how climate trends are impacting and will impact nature and people. People, Over to you, Andrew. Hi, thank you. Uh, this was a really excellent panel and it's inspiring uh, to hear all of the great work that uh, that my colleagues are doing. Um, what what I need to do, though, is I want to start by explaining a little bit how the work that we do is different. So if you'd advance the slide, please. So Climate Central, uh, we are a science research and communications organization. We're nonpartisan. We're policy neutral, technology neutral. We're non advocacy. A big part of what we do is we do climate science and we connect with climate journalists and climate communications uh, because a big goal of ours is to try to catal uh, catalyze the media and the NGOs uh, and government educators and businesses in the United States to be more effective communicators about climate change and climate issues. Next slide, please. And our goal is really to help Americans understand climate trends, risks, and solutions to connect the dots between the trends that are going on in the world, many of which uh, the speakers have already talked about, uh, and help people to understand that those trends are not going to get any better, that adaptation is only going to get harder until we stop putting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Next slide. Uh, so our strategy around climate change and health communications, it's less about the public safety point of view, although that's certainly something we think about, but it's really about helping people to understand climate change as an issue. So a big part of our goal is trying to help uh, connect the personal risks of climate change uh, for people and their families, and health is a really great way to do that. Next slide. 
So uh, last summer, or, I'm sorry, summer before last, we put out a report on, uh, on exercise and sports and the, the difficulties of doing uh, exercise uh, when it's really hot outside. We put out the report, we put out a variety of materials that help the media to be able to cover that topic uh, in a new way. And so you can see the anchors here on CNN. This is their meteorologist and their sports anchor having a conversation about climate change, about extreme heat and about health. Next slide. A big part of what we do though, is we work with, with scientists and, uh, to try to amplify their work and to try to get it into a format where it can have really high uptake with the media. So this is actually, these are visualizations that we put together based on the paper that, uh, that Rich talked about at the beginning. So showing the different zones in the United States uh, and the point where hospitalizations start to increase. So geographic differences based on, based on climate, based on uh, uh, vulnerability and then try to really localize that information. So for, uh, for each of the media markets in the country, we produce graphics like the one on the right that then show that trend. So what is the trend in heat, in heat index values above 90 degrees? So you can see that that's rising in many places in the country. Next slide. And it's not just people, we also think about pets because our goal again is to really try to connect people with the issue of climate change. So here's something we just put out last week, thinking about days above 77, uh, which is a temperature where you start to get uh, pavement temperatures that become uncomfortable and potentially unsafe for, uh, for dogs. And so here's the trend uh, in days above uh, 77 in Phoenix. Next slide. So the other, th the other reason that we're interested in health as part of our communication strategy is that it helps expose some of the multiple dimensions of climate change. So, it, so while we've talked a lot about heat and that's the main topic of this panel, there are other dimensions to, uh, to climate change as well. Next slide. So allergies are, are an incredibly powerful way of talking to people. I understand that was a topic of a previous uh, CDC panel. One of the things that I really like about the allergy story, about the pollen story, is that there's actually a direct link between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and something that's impacting people. You don't have to do this bank shot through the atmosphere and the ocean and the climate system. It's really CO2 affects plants that produce more, uh, more pollen and allergies get worse. So you can see here instantly the benefits of reducing carbon emissions. So with the aggressive cuts in carbon emissions, consistent with, uh, with, uh, with the Paris Agreement goals, consistent with the goals of the new, new administration, you end up with uh, uh, keeping pollen levels more or less at what they are now. Uh, if you don't have that, those aggressive reductions, you end up with, uh, with much higher uh, emissions and much, I'm sorry, much higher emissions, much higher pollen loads. Next slide. Uh, mosquitoes, another important health issue that's related to temperature. Next slide. Uh, smoke uh, from wildfires in the West is really important. We're gonna have some more content around smoke and wildfire trends coming out soon. Next. Uh, and of course, then uh, producing infographics and things that help people to interpret uh, what's going on uh, with some of these major stories. Next. So the, the other thing that's really challenging is that there are the costs of inaction and benefits of action. And this is really thinking about many of the previous speakers have been talking about adaptation. Here, we're really trying to connect the dots between the challenges in our lives and the big carbon problem. Next slide. So for example, we, we put out a report this year on electric vehicles, which are an important part of uh, the climate adaptation or climate mitigation strategy uh, in the United States. Next slide. Uh, and what we tried to do was then connect that with reductions in air pollution. So switching to electric vehicles makes the air cleaner and you can actually translate, translate that into lives saved. Uh, this is data from Princeton, next slide. And you can put it in economic terms as well in terms of healthcare costs avoided. You can do this for heat, you can do this for pollen, for, all, for many of these issues. And that's been an important part of communications and things like the National Climate Assessment, next. So just to very quickly wrap up, we're, we're really interested in health less in terms of the public safety aspect, although obviously we're concerned about that, but we're very, we're very much interested in health as a, as a way to help advance the conversation around climate change in the United States. Uh, so if you'd like additional resources, uh, we have a media library that has many of the graphics that I've shown uh, available. We also have a new service called Real-Time Climate. Uh, where you can sign up for alerts related to heat and energy and other climate topics uh, around the country. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, we made it through all of the presentations. Thanks to our panelists. Big round of applause uh, for staying on time. I know it was we're covering a lot of content in a very short amount of time, uh, but we have some time for discussion. We have some great questions that have been coming in in the chat and uh, in the Q and A. So keep. Uh, sending those along, uh, but I'll go ahead and kick it off with, uh, I saw several questions asking about worker uh, health and vulnerability. Um, so, and this is to all of our panelists, we're gonna start um, the discussion with everyone. Uh, so feel free to jump in, but uh, one of, a few questions around this, uh, how are workers more susceptible to uh, heat related illness and what are some strategies uh, for uh, reducing heat related uh, illness and death. Uh, and I know um, we have a few different perspectives from various panelists. So maybe uh, a way to kick this off is asking, uh, putting Matt on the spot and asking about some of uh, the state um, initiatives that can happen to, uh, to address worker health. Sure, so I can start off. Um, on our HEAT website, we have partnered with our state OSHA program to put together a toolkit for outdoor workers. Pulling from the federal OSHA program, they have a lot of great bilingual materials uh, with a campaign called Water Rest Shade. And in the, that variety of uh, documents that have been created by OSHA, they have some tools, including a uh, app which can monitor dangerous heat temperatures. Uh, in terms of some of the other resources, there are some training guides for managers that talk about how to hydrate properly, putting up shade structures, and also from an agricultural perspective of, and also just from an educational perspective, trying to use a lot of pictures to communicate the ideas of safe practices for working in the heat. Uh, what we have done also in the state is partner with various organizations, nonprofits, um, different government agencies that have outdoor workers. Recently, we worked with our state parks program to put together a webinar and to teach their volunteers and employees about heat-related illness prevention, reckoning, and treatment. So an easy way to reach a large amount is in this COVID environment to do some webinars for various different um, companies, et cetera. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, and I'll just open it up. Are, are there any comments from the other panelists around the issue of workers' health? I have a, a comment um, and a question, maybe another question for Matt about um, OSHA. So when we looked at this, uh, the uh, uh, occupations of people who died from extreme heat in, um, in Maricopa County, Outdoor workers, uh, landscape, construction, these were very um, high death categories. And um, we know that OSHA is a federal state program. And I believe, at least at the time, the federal government did not have um, any mandatory um, rules about how hot is too hot for people to go to work. And I think it's a state by state basis. And I'm wondering. Um, what anyone might know about how Arizona or other states have um, approached this uh, business about really stopping work when it's too hot. So I'll briefly touch upon that. And I agree with you that it's a state by state basis. And in terms of worker protection, you have to think about it in terms of it's not a one size fits all type approach. Everyone is affected by the heat, but some are more vulnerable. And we don't know what certain prescription medications people are on with chronic medical conditions we can actually put them more at risk at lower temperatures than what we think is a um, adverse temperature. So more research is needed, I think, into defining and categorizing the different circumstances by which some of these people face. But there are a variety of tools in the tool belt for working in the heat, uh, we know from just an occupational safety perspective of just uh, acclimating people to the heat and rotating people in and out of different hot environments and also just reiterating the importance of hydration and shade. 
So while we're on this topic of various um, kind of groups of people that may be more vulnerable to heat, there's been a few questions about women that are pregnant uh, or people that are pregnant, whether uh, they have a disproportionate uh, uh, susceptibility to heat, um, whether there's information on that. So uh, I could just select someone. Um, I know someone specifically asked Jalan if she had any comment on that. So maybe Jalan, do you do you have something to add? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely start off and and thank you, Miss um, Toms, for that question. So I believe, and I'm getting old, so I can't remember too much, but there was a study last year that I think spoke exactly to your question: the fact that minorities in general are exposed to to more hazardous stuff, whether it's urban heat islands, living near uh, point sources of pollution, so plants and industry. And so because of those factors, plus the stress just from being a person of color in this country, in addition to being pregnant, that can lead to, again, un, you know, unwanted outcomes. So whether it be stillborn or underweight or et cetera. So definitely when you talk about targeted outreach to our folks that could be highly vulnerable in a situation, um, pregnant women, particularly women of color, are part of those populations that have to be a part of any type of campaign, educational campaign, whether it be from our local governments, but I would even push it even further, our doctors and our, 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 you know, again, our doctors that work with pregnant women. So definitely they're a vulnerable population and something that we need to pay more attention to. Thank you for your question. Thank you for that. Um, any other uh, input from other panelists? Uh, well, uh, I think you brought up actually, Jalan, um, a question that, uh, that we had was around uh, doctors and meteorologists and how that, uh, those are two groups that um, the general public trusts and it's been viewed to trust most often. Uh, and I think that there's an interesting intersect here in those two groups uh, with uh, heat and health. And I'm actually going to um, ask uh, Andy to get involved on this uh, and see, uh, you know, you work closely with meteorologists uh, in the work that you do with Climate Central. Um, and what are some of the strategies that, that are effective for um, getting the word out? about how climate change is affecting heat and what uh, future projections are gonna be as well as um, how that affects health. So thank you for that question. It's a great topic. I mean, we're one of the things that we find, and I think you find this across all of the issues in the country is that every, everything is so polarized right now uh, that people are very, they're, you, you know, we don't all go to the same, you know, the same news sites the way we used to but there are a few key places where people have very high trust. And so your local TV meteorologists, despite all the ribbing they get about their nightly forecasts, tend to have very high, uh, high trust uh, with their, among the people that watch them. And they're, they're usually the only scientists that people interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're a really great resource for, and, and are often on point for communicating about important science topics. So we've really worked with them on, on climate issues and trying to, both educate them on how to talk about climate change, giving them training, but on also really to provide the materials that, that, that fit their needs. Uh, but your TV meteorologists are often the ones who will get pulled in to talk about any, you know, any kind of science-based issue. We're very interested in how to work more closely with, uh, with physicians, because I think that, you know, one of the lessons of COVID is that, you know, we can, experts can talk all they want about the safety of the virus, but people are really going to look to their local doctor for or the vaccine, but people are really going to look to their local doctor in many cases for that kind of final confirmation. And so finding ways to get uh, to get folks who are just trusted messengers to tell uh, to tell these stories, I think is really important. Hey, Claudia. Yeah, I was going to point to you, Jalan, <laughs> I know. <laughs> No, I was like, oh, no, that's great, yeah. Andy. I just wanted to add something really quickly from a personal perspective. When I was uh, the primary caregiver for my grandparents, I had many conversations with their doctors. And basically, they were prescribing medicines that made it even worse for my, my grandparents to even try and, you know, kind of acclimate to high, higher temperatures like, you know, so 
and, and I would talk about extreme heat and they would like give me the gloss over. So I think there's such a need for education and connecting the dots between, you know, what meteorologists are saying to what the prescriptions, quote unquote, that are happening in the conversations that are happening in these offices. And I really want to uplift the work of the Alliance of Environmental Health Nurses and the Medical Society Consortium on Climate Change, because that is exactly what they're doing. They are training and teaching nurses and doctors and physicians of all sorts to be able to talk about this, not only to advocate on the Hill and beyond, but to bring that into their practice. And that is definitely what's needed because from firsthand experiences, if, if you have, if you're advocating for your parents or your family, and your doctor, again, is, is looking at you crazy, it makes it hard to, to be in a position to protect the folks that you care about, so. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, definitely trying to get a sense of, you know, what's the most effective way to engage uh, as we talk about disproportionately affected populations? How, how can the interventions that we do most uh, have the biggest impact? Um, any other comments from other panelists on that? Uh, so another question that I saw come up, uh, and I think it's timely as um, we are in a new phase of the pandemic, uh, but, and this was directed at you specifically, Matt, but maybe others can chime in, uh, but how has uh, COVID affected your heat response at the local or state level um, this past year? And maybe what are some lessons learned going into this next, uh, from this next season? Sure. So there, there was... Too many things that I could say in a short amount of time, but something that came to mind is that we had to integrate messaging together that combined COVID-19 and heat. An example would be uh, in our summers, we had long lines for getting testing in the beginning of 2020. And with the increasing temperatures, you have these uh, healthcare workers working outside in higher heat conditions. And so we did a lot of social media and outreach regarding just reminding them of heat safety practices for these outdoor workers and PPE that were out there with the drive-through lines for COVID-19 testing. And then in addition to that, we had to also uh, deal with just the overburdened messaging of heat and COVID and just how do you pace yourself so that people aren't over messaged with our chronic heat conditions and then knowing when to react when uh, those higher risk categories happen. So with the um, drop in cooling centers in my presentation, one of the challenges that we faced and heard about from our local partners was that they didn't have the guidance or the clearance from their higher senior leadership of opening a cooling center because they wanted to safely operate. So when the CDC guidance came out for COVID-19 and cooling centers, they felt more reassured um, following kind of those protocols to open up again. But what this caused was a delay in these centers opening. So we have that gap, which could contribute to the larger number of deaths because we didn't have those resources early on in the summer. But now in 2021, we have those resources ahead of the game, which I think will be beneficial for uh, what we see in the numbers this year. Thanks for that. Really helpful, Matt. Um, other other comments? Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, go here. I'm kind of working through a long list of questions. Uh, so jumping around a little bit, uh, obviously lots of topics being discussed. Um, but a question for you, Sharon. So uh, what strategies have been effective for protecting people from extreme heat who are also experiencing uh, situations like homelessness, uh, where they don't uh, have a place for air with air conditioning. Um, and then another, maybe related, maybe a separate question, but uh, as we think about heat, we, we often talk about it in an urban context uh, and the built environment, but can you also speak to um, the maybe uh, specific issues that people may face in rural areas as well. You may be muted. There we go. Sorry. There we go. Uh, so as to the um, question about what strategies are effective for people who 
don't have air conditioning. That is a really tough one uh, because in some research that we had done recently, we asked people about a lot of different um, strategies they might use in uh, to cool down during hot weather, during heat waves. Oh, things like fans or opening windows or taking cold showers or eating cold foods. And it seemed like that had, though, when people used those strategies, they were actually more likely to report experiencing heat illness. And we think it's because they do that because they don't have access to air conditioning. So right now um, we're, we're limited and and so providing, you know, cool places, whether it's indoors or outdoors, is, is really essential. Um, and that gets to the question I saw some people um, raising about, well, what about carbon, you know, and the fragile energy grid? And that is really a conundrum that we, we have to deal with. Like, we need alternate sources of energy, um, clean energy. I would say that's like the number one thing that we need to be looking at. Like, how are we going to cool the world um, with uh, without increasing the impacts of of extreme heat, both locally because air conditioning creates heat, and you know fossil fuel emissions. So, with regards to rural populations, I saw lots of um, considerations about that uh, in the um, chat. And that's not something that I've done research on personally, but I'm certainly aware and have read about the, the issues um, with farm workers, with landscape workers, construction workers, all of who, who are more likely to be racial or ethnic um, minority or, or immigrant populations. And um, this is an area where the OSHA um, rules come into play. I saw more in the chat about which states have been more progressive about that. Thanks for that, Sharon. Any any other comments from other panelists on that? So I'm going to engage Rish here. He's been uh, quiet. Uh, so uh, Rish, question for you. There was a question about um, uh, adopting the wet bulb uh, indicator for heat. Um, so I figured this might be a good place for you to get involved, uh, given your, you know, uh, heat risk uh, mapping that you've been doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, you know, um, we, people have used wet bulb globe temperature as a measure of exposure. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, fairly sophisticated and a bit more complex exposure measure to create. And sometimes all the underlying data necessary to create that exposure measure isn't available. Uh, but people have used it and people have also tried to like correlate that information or correlate wet bulb globe information with other traditionally used exposure measures such as heat index and daily max temperatures. So there are studies that I'm aware of which have sort of compared both. So uh, again, in, in the absence of getting actual underlying data to construct wet bulb temperature, uh, you know, we could perhaps continue, use some of the traditional measures such as daily max temp and daily min temp, as well as like daily measures of parent temperatures like heat index and humidity based products. Thanks for that. Uh, so we're already running up on time uh, and I just wanted to make a few closing comments. Uh, there were a, quite a few questions for about this recording and the slides. Uh, we ha do have this recorded and we'll have it on the CDC YouTube site uh, as soon as we can. Um, there are a few uh, hurdles we need to jump with that, uh, but we will get that up on uh, the website where you uh, registered for the webinar. Um, also, I want to just say a huge thank you to our panelists. This has been such a dynamic conversation, uh, so many wonderful uh, various topics that we've tackled in such a short amount of time, but I think it gives, uh, it's stimulated a lot of discussion uh, and highlighted a lot of issues and gaps that uh, need some further work. So thank you all. Um, and finally, if you can go to the next slide, Renee. 
I just wanted to mention that uh, for more information about the CDC Climate Health Program, you can check out our website. And if you'd like to get in touch or uh, learn about more of our uh, other webinars, uh, you can reach out to us at climateandhealth at cdc.gov. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you.